Well, good evening. Whoa. I believe the microphone is on. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight to the 29th annual LAM lecture, part of the Leading Voices in Public Health. Uh, as is a tradition uh, with the LAM lecture, uh, the presidents of the Public Health Student Association will introduce both the lecture and the speaker this evening. So while I'm really honored and pleased to have the speaker that we have, I don't get a chance to introduce them tonight. But instead, I'm going to bring up Sarah K. Johnson and Marsha Osler, the two presidents of the Public Health Student Association, who will introduce the speaker. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As Dr. Wyckoff said, this is the Leading Voices Lecture and the 29th Lamb Lecture this year. Each year, the college hosts a lecture to recognize John P. Lamb, Jr., who was the first dean of ETSU School of Health and the College of Public and Allied Health. Lamb was actually a Johnson City native who attended ETSU for his bachelor's degree. He received a certificate of public health from Vanderbilt University and then went on to receive his master of public health from Yale. In 1949, he returned to ETSU and became a professor and then he became dean of the College of Health in 1963 as ETSU was working on becoming, um, moving from a college to becoming a university. So during his time in the field, Lamb actually uh, received numerous awards and recognitions. And to acknowledge his contributions to the university and the field of public health and the region, um, each year the college hosts a lecture in his name. So this evening, we're very honored to welcome this evening's Lamb Lecture from Dr. Reed Tuxen. Dr. Tuxen is a graduate of Howard University, Georgetown University School of Medicine, and the University of Pennsylvania's General Internal Medicine Residency and Fellowship Programs. He's also been a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholar. Prior to assuming his position as managing director of Tuxen Health Connections, Dr. Tuxen enjoyed a long tenure as executive vice president and chief medical affairs for the United Health Group, which is the nation's largest health insurer and most comprehensive health services company in the industry. Prior to that, he has also held positions including senior vice president for professional standards of the American Medical Association, president of the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science in Los Angeles, and senior vice Vice President for Programs of the March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation and Commissioner of Public Health for the District of Columbia. An active member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, the Advisory Committee to the, Nas to the Director of National Institutes of Health, the Boards of S Cell Therapeutics Incorporated, Howard University, the American Telemedicine Association, among others. He con continues to con make contributions to public health concerning radiation testing, health reform, infant mortality, children's health, and violence. He's also authored The Doctor in the Mirror, a book focused on the empowerment to overcome everyday health issues for Americans over 55, and has recently been honored by the My Modern Healthcare magazine as number nine on the list of the 50 most powerful physician executives. Without further ado, let us please welcome Dr. Reed Tuxen. Wow. Thank you all. Thank you. I had the great pleasure of having um, dinner with um, these two students and a few of their colleagues. And I will tell you, the future is in good hands. Um, what you are doing at ETSU uh, in terms of being able to attract students who have uh, passion for health, a concern for life, and a willingness to train to be able to be a contributor to the best of all of those is really uh, quite praiseworthy. Randy, excuse me, Dr. Wyckoff, and I, <laughs> I think it's not supposed to call deans by their first name like that. But we've been trying to, uh, to make this happen for a long time. Um, it's funny how people introduce themselves or make themselves important to you. Um, and for the young people, and, and by the way, almost everything I'm going to say here is for the, because the older folks know everything, and I'm not going to say anything <clears throat> that you don't already know, <clears throat> except for the things that you violently disagree with, of which there will be a lot. Um, but for the young people, uh, Randy sent me a note, and in it was a badge with 39, the symbol. And he sent me a business card of his that was his business card, which said, we are going to move in the America's Health Rankings, you know, from where we were in the 40-something to 39. And it just blew us away. And I went running down the hall, showing it to everybody that our work was being noticed by somebody who was taking it seriously. And it was so energizing. So to the young people, never ever be tentative 
about reaching out. <clears throat> Never be tentative about sending your resume to someone, about sending whatever it may be. You have no idea of what it might do to the person on the other end. And so this meeting, or the fact that you were inflicted, I mean, the fact that I'm here um, <laughs> is really because Dr. Wyckoff sent me something out of the blue that just said, hey, and all of a sudden, two or three years later, it took to make this happen. Um, here we are. It is an honor to be associated with the, the Lamb Lecture Series, first because of who Dr. Lamb was, and secondly because of the people that have uh, preceded me. This is a critical time in the history of health in America. It's a critical time in our nation's health. We will either, I hope, move that ball forward with great perseverance, or we will continue to suffer the consequences of not making progress. I like to show that slide mainly because my son was in that scrum somewhere, and um, as, as he was winning the uh, Division II National NCAA Rugby Championship a couple of years ago, and so somewhere in there is this kid of mine. Um, I have no idea. We've been taking the pulse of the health of the nation for almost 25 years in doing something called America's Health Rankings, which most of you are probably familiar. There is reason for concern. The good news, we're living longer. Life expectancy is up, 78.5 from 68.2 in 1950 alone. And Americans get very confused, because when you show them and they see, we're living longer, things are good, we're going forward. Yay, America. And the reasons that things are doing well, in a lot of reasons of public health, but one of the things you note, cardiovascular disease deaths, 35% decrease since 1990. Cancer deaths down 8%. We're, 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 we're handling and managing the death rates from the big things that were killing us. The bad news is we're living longer, but we're living sicker. There's something underneath the surface. 31% of the population, for example, is hypertensive. And of those, only 50% are controlled. This, this is not a new disease. I mean, we've had hypertension for a long time. So this chronic illness is there. We're living longer, but we're living sicker. 9.5% of the population is diabetic. 26 million diabetics in America today, 79 million pre-diabetics. One-third of the people born in 2020 will develop diabetes. We are spending now $194 billion, headed to $500 billion by 2020. Just do the math on what that's all about. And I don't have here the tears for the misery and the suffering. I just have the numbers. Those are the data and the economics. It doesn't have the humanity that's associated with that. This increasing prevalence of chronic disease looks something like that. We're living longer, but we're living sicker with these chronic illnesses. Well, if that weren't bad enough, let's look even deeper underneath the iceberg. 28% of the population, because we're now looking at the risk factors that give you those chronic illnesses. 20% of the population is now obese. If current trends continue, 43% of the population will be obese by 2018. We are spending $344 billion. Notice the slide I did before. I want you to do some math in your mind. Cross-check this. How much money was the whole health care bill? A trillion? I just spent 344 here, another couple, of, you, you get what I'm going at. And that's not even talking about, that, that's just going in the, in the out years of what we have to get done. Hospitals, supersizing equipment for obese patients. They're making the, the, the beds bigger. What's even worse, I've been in some meetings where hospitals have done their strategic planning sessions. I'm sitting in the back trying to be quiet and cool. They're talking about moving the hospitals to locations where people are really obese, because now they have a real population that they're going to have a lot of sick people, and they'll do very well. 26% of the American people are sedentary. They get no physical activity other than getting up and going to work. 
I loved making that fly. <laughs> just loved it. Some people wonder, wait, couch potato? Okay, I got it. I know I said it. 21% of the American people are smokers. Now, for you in public health, it's either a good news or a bad news story. The good news is we brought tobacco smoking down significantly over the last 25 years to 21%. The bad news, 21% of the American people still smoke tobacco. Every, you know, the number of kids, 4,000 kids get introduced to tobacco every day, 1,000 of them become regular smokers every month. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's horrible, the numbers. 440,000 deaths annually from tobacco. $193 billion in tobacco-related health costs. So what is happening is we are producing a storm of preventable chronic illness. Chronic illness that has to be treated. It is going to overwhelm the medical care delivery system. It is inevitable. And so what we have here is a collision of two forces. This extraordinary and unabatable, at least for the moment, escalation of preventable chronic illness hitting head on with a medical care system that we already cannot afford. To give you a sense of the economics of this, that top curve is the escalation in health care costs compared to Social Security, discretionary spending, and other mandatory spending. So students, whenever you are looking and hearing about this budget problem in the, in the government, when you're looking at this issue of sequestration, when the president releases his budget, which he did just yesterday, you need to be thinking very carefully, where is the money being spent? That's what's happening. And it is overwhelmingly scary because there's one reality you need to be sure of. That curve cannot continue. Something is going to have to hammer that curve down because your nation will sink. Why will your nation sink? This is where healthcare expenditures are. On the left was up until about a couple of years ago, the top two curves are physician directed and hospital delivered care. Look at the slope of the escalation of that curve. That's how you get basically the $2.5 trillion of health expenditures every year in America. Look at the slope of those two curves. The other things are important, durable medical equipment, nursing home, pharmacy, but it's physician and hospital delivered care. On the right is if you continue that out to uh, 2017. There is no way that we will get to $4.3 trillion of health care expenditures. It will be hammered. And the question will be, how will it be hammered? Let me tell you what it really will tell you where the problem is. This is, at the, this is just looking at purely at Medicare and Medicaid. And if you look at the slope of those curves compared to Social Security, you saw that, that Medicare is essentially broke. There's no more money to be gotten from Medicare. The state governments in every state that I have been in are almost essentially broke. And the reason is because of Medicaid and the cost of employee, state government employees' health insurance. So you can't get any money for education. You can't get money for innovation, discretionary spending. It's all going out the door, ultimately, into health. So your states are totally scared to death. Every governor, and we talk to a lot of governors, the governors are frightened to death for their health care costs. So you're not going to see any cost increases, any more cost escalations that you can have at the state level. You, you rule out federal, you rule out state, where does that leave you? It leaves you with private employers. There's no private employer in America who is, especially any that's competing in a global economy, which all of the economy is, who can say, okay, you know what? I'm so excited, I'm going to write a higher check for health care for my employees. Not going to happen. And you know there's no small business man or woman in America that is willing to pay more for theirs. So guess what the only place you can go to get more money today? It's the individual. It's the average American. The top part of that chart is the top curve is out-of-pocket expenditures for the average American. The bottom curve is wages. Is any student, any student here believe that the wage line is getting ready to go up dramatically to close that gap? ain't going to happen. So that's our dilemma. 
The poor average person is going to have to find some way, though, to keep cost shifting over to them. This is the American dilemma at this time. This massive amount of preventable illness washing into a delivery system that we can't afford, and you hit seeing two freight trains collide head on. Unfortunately, the way we use the resources we have now is suboptimal. Healthcare is extremely complex. There was a report back in 2000 from the Institute of Medicine, and I would urge any of you to Google this report. It's called To Air is Human. It doesn't take long to read it. Just read the executive summary. Just go online, Google, and say To Air is Human. What it describes is the number of people that we in America kill every day in our hospitals. Not because hospitals are bad. Not because people are, you know, who run hospitals are bad people. Medicine is very complex. We do a terrible job, though. And, and so the number of people that we kill in, every year in hospitals is just absolutely frightening. It was followed a year later by a report that you really ought to read, which is called Crossing the Quality Chasm. Crossing the Quality Chasm lays out this problem of quality. You would be surprised, but let me tell you a statistic. Half of medical care delivered today is inconsistent with scientific evidence. Half. Now, let me remind you of something in my biography. I'm the former senior vice president of professional standards of the AMA. I love doctors. I am proud of doctors. This isn't because doctors are crappy people. No one in my medical school class fought to be last in the class. Well, except for that one dude. But <laughs> other than that guy, doctors are extremely principled people. But medicine is very complex. All of these reports were just redone in the last year, the last six months. And this is called Best Care at Lower Cost. And basically it said that we waste $700 billion in poor quality, inappropriate healthcare delivery. This is the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. So my point is, we've got a real problem with our medical care system that we have to work on. And guess what? It's getting ready to be even more complex. If it wasn't already tough, it's getting ready to be real complex with the human genome, the new diagnostics, new labs on a chip, new medicines. I used to be the head of the, 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 the Secretary of Health's Advisory Committee for Genetics for like six years. And when I first started out, the briefing books were like that big. And when I finished, the briefing books were like 14 New York telephone size things. I mean, the genomic revolution is so fast and so pervasive. So trying to figure out what to do, this is a chart that gives you a sense of it. The number of facts per decision as the human genome knowledge increases. The little red line across the bottom is human cognitive capability. You notice it doesn't change <laughs> unless y'all have got some kind of new fish oil pills here in Tennessee, you know. But basically, we're not we're not going to get any smarter. So we're going to have to have a lot of help if we're going to figure out how to use these assets very well. And for you in the public health side, it's going to get really complicated. Because here's just one article that came out not long ago, rethinking junk DNA, right? Most of the changes that affect disease don't lie in the genes themselves, they lie in the switches. Small changes in environmental exposure can slightly alter gene switches, which results in disease. So now we got the genomics, and then we have all the environment around it. And it's the interaction between the environmental toxins and so forth and how it interacts with each individual human being. So you think about the permutations of complexity going forward as public health gets involved now with the clinical medicine. And it gets very interesting and gets very complicated very quickly. This stuff is hard. And then lastly, to give you a sense of what's going on, is all these chronically ill people are living, which means they need what? They need a lot of coordinated care. They need not only the medical care, but as you in the public health school know, you also need the non-medical social support care to be arrayed around them. And now we have a fragmented system that doesn't connect, and somehow we're gonna to have to figure out how do we put it together. This is a woman that I took care of. Of course, that's not exactly what she looked like because she's hippified, so I don't go to jail. She had high blood pressure that was not diagnosed, leading to congestive heart failure. She had diabetes that was not diagnosed, leading her to a peripheral nerve disease and ultimately causing her to be in a wheelchair. She had four different doctors. None of us were connected by any information system, all in different locations. 
And none of us talk to the other ones. And so we re-prescribe the same medicine, prescribe medicine that doubled and that she should have had, prescribe medicine that she wasn't supposed to have because of something else that she was on. We were all disconnected. When we finally discharged her to home, not paying attention to her social history because, oh man, that's boring anyway. I really want to get into the science of it. Who cares about the social history? She lived in this big city alone. We discharged her to home and didn't know that the Meals on Wheels program, see the refrigerator with wheels? <laughs> I did that. I'm so proud of that. You figure out how to do Meals on Wheels. <laughs> the Meals on Wheels program was cut back in her town because of budget cuts and because philanthropy had gone down, so there wasn't any way for her to get a hot meal on a regular basis. The home health care aid program that transferred her from bed to chair was cut back so there wasn't anybody moving around so she was sitting on her hind parts 20 hours a day either in the bed or in the chair. What happens when you sit on your hind parts for 20 hours a day? You get a decubitus ulcer. She couldn't fight off the infection because why? She was nutritionally depleted because she was not what? Eating? We told her to come back to the clinic three Wednesdays at one o'clock but guess what? The mobile van that carries wheelchairs doesn't run Wednesdays at one o'clock. Next time we saw her was by ambulance. And she presented to us in florid congestive heart failure, septic, nutritionally depleted. We redid everything we had done before and more, costing a gazillion dollars, but worse, here was a great American woman who lived in the most technologically advanced society in the history of the universe who was scared, sick, and alone. And that was the story that she presents. You know what? This is the reason why your children will be in deep doo-doo because of the budget deficits in this country. Because the fastest growing deficit is in Medicare and the fastest portion of Medicare deficits is what? Readmission back to the hospital in 30 days for what? Congestive heart failure. This story is real, is my point. It's one lady who is telling you a story about your nation and about how we're going to have to bring these pieces of the puzzle together. Somebody's got to pull that together. Somebody's got to be there. And these are the challenges as we go forward. So thinking about solutions, they have to be comprehensive, interconnected, and end-to-end. -end. These two people blew my mind, these two people. They are the chairwomen of the what? The interprofessional Association. I should have written it there, but I didn't know you. <laughs> Interconnected solutions. In other words, they seem to be on a violent campaign or nonviolent campaign against siloization. They seem to get the message that the only way you can work your out of a problem as deep as we are in is if we can somehow find a way to connect. We must focus then on the lives of real people trying to overcome real problems. Some of you may be interested in health policy. I hope you are. That is good. Do me a favor. Before you opine on health policy, make sure you understand the real problems of real people. That the challenges require you to get deep down. Don't get into just theory. You got to get underneath this stuff because that's where it really is. Listening to people. It ought to be required, I'm sure it is for you. It ought to be required that everywhere you go, you talk to people. I go to airports all over the place. I sit down and say, because hey, y'all notice a lot of y'all I met, I do just that in the airport. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. What's going on? I, you talk, you got to listen to the pain and the stories out there in real life so we can make a difference. First and foremost, solutions have got to be based on innovation. Disruptive innovation is a key word. You should read that book called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. It's a good book. You should take a look at it. You should read all the Clayton Christensen stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty good, pretty sharp, and you can, you can get into it fast. But this notion, you know, because what happens in public health, we don't use enough the concept of innovation. It exists everywhere. It doesn't exist enough in public health. We want disruptive, disruptive innovation. We're going to mess stuff up, bring ideas out that just screw everything up, replace more expensive traditional interventions, create, and this is the key word, new value 
propositions. Significantly improved performance based on new performance criteria. Anybody have a cell phone? So was this thing competing against the phone with a wire that was connected to the wall? Right? You know, it does all the stuff. It, oh, and I can make a phone call too? I mean, jeez, my goodness. My phone is my entire life, right? But it's because of the apps that are on it. And, oh, by the way, hello. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, great. I got to get back to texting. Like, this dude was texting all the whole time. He's, here. He's mortified now, right? I like him. I wouldn't mess him up. He's good, too. My point is this. The phone that they've created, my iPhone or your Android, is not competing against the princess phone with the wire. It's a whole new thing based on new performance criteria. Value, optimize health outcomes at lower total cost of care versus existing treatment. That's the key. Does it take quality up and costs out? We need things that do that. Do we make prevention and clinical care simpler and less complex to deliver and more convenient? more personal. Remember this because I'm coming back to this again in some detail. More convenient and more personal. And then can we move hospital care to the outpatient and outpatient to the home and community? These are the kinds of innovations we need. And we need to be thinking broadly and differently. Let me tell you public health students, you need to be connecting to people outside of public health in ETSU. You should be not only interdisciplinary, within health, you should be interdisciplinary outside of health because you need a whole new way of thinking about things. Purchasers, the people that pay the bills, the federal government, the state government, the employers, the big ones, the small business people, the people paying the bills are going and are now causing disruption. They have had it with the traditional medical care system. They can't keep doing what they, when they read the report to Air is Human and found out that all those people were getting sick and getting killed in hospitals, they went ballistic. Because nobody, it was a secret until 2000. Nobody knew. That's why this Air is Human report is so important for the students to read. No one knew the numbers. When the employer said, what am I buying? What in the world am I paying for? This crap? We would never tolerate this crap in our business. We have Six Sigma manufacturing processes. Minute degrees of error will not be tolerated. You're telling me this? It, it, it scared them to death. And what they did was to move into our space and say, since y'all aren't going to clean it up, we're going to force change. And change is being driven by the people who are paying for care as much, if not more, than the people that are delivering care. So value-based health benefits. They have said, reading the Riot Act to the public, excuse me, I'm paying for your health insurance. You will start to get some skin in the game. Because as long as I'm paying all the bill, you'll never change. You got a free ride. That ain't gonna happen anymore. We're gonna shift burden onto you. You, dear employee, are gonna have a new value-based health benefits. And in fact, consumer-driven health plans grew from 25% grew 25 from 2009 to 2012. More and more and more people are now going to have the opportunity to participate in the outcomes of what they do and the consequences of their choices and decisions. But that's also being aligned with new value-based benefits for the physicians and hospitals. No, this thing called fee-for-service, it will die a very slow but certain death. No more are they going to say to the doc, uh, look, I understand you did this, and you did this, and you did this, then you did this, then you did that, then you did this, and you did this, and you did that. No, no, excuse me, dude, do that. <laughs> One big bill. How did the patient, I'm paying for the outcome and you figure out how you got there. Because it's not, it's not it's, it financially doesn't make sense to keep paying for piecework. It doesn't make sense. So value-based reimbursement. We will reimburse you based on the value that you are delivering. So what does that mean? It means in the clinical medical world, you're being measured. You're being measured intensely. 
around how much quality and how cost effective did you do. And then what they're saying to the networks is within that spot of all the doctors that are in a network of physicians and hospitals, we're going to sec pull out a sweet spot of the best performers. And guess what? We're going to then give our employees a special discount if they choose health benefits that only go to the best performers. The level of accountability and measurement in clinical medicine now is going to be very high. And it's going to be associated then with the choices that people make. And guess what that means? All those performance measures are going to be completely transparent to the individual. So now, you know, at, at companies like the one I just left at United, they absolutely will tell you, this doctor sucks and costs twice as much as this doctor. This hospital sucks and costs twice as much as this hospital. Now you choose where you want to go. And the employer is saying, not only are you going to choose where you want to go, but if you choose to go to the sucky high one, you will pay more out of your pocket than if you went to the other one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Performance, measurement, and accountability. Think about that in a minute. Here's what is also happening. This is the sea change. This is a, a, a complex slide, but let me just try to break it down as simply as I can. What it is basically saying is that now we are going to be moving and driving from solo practitioners, of which 50% of healthcare practices are twosy, threesy, foursy doctors, over to ultimately fully integrated medical systems. And we're going to move from fee for service, piecework, to being paid at some levels of increasing of, of, a, of a more global all-in fee. And those stars are there to represent that there'll be multiple permutations of this depending on local market conditions, geography, practice patterns, and so forth. But inevitably, we are moving to what they call, now this will be fun for you, public health, what they call population medicine. They talk about populations here as an enrolled population of patients. You think of populations as a community and a more macro level, but they talk now about populations. So here's the deal. If I want to make money in these new models, whether you call them patient-centered medical homes or accountable care organizations, here's what they're saying. If you can decrease the use of emergency rooms, by your patients, if you can decrease preventable hospitalizations, if you can decrease lengths of stay, if you can decrease readmissions back to the hospital, you will save money for the system. And guess what? You should enjoy a significant part of those savings, and the individuals should enjoy it for lower premiums. That's the future of the world. So the physician community is beginning to completely catch on. That's the way to make money. You make money by delivering better quality, and taking costs out, you get to benefit on those revenue stream and patients get it to benefit because of lower costs. So guess what that means? What do you know about what it's going to take to people to be able not to use emergency room when they, when they don't need it? What do you know about what it's going to take to keep people out of the hospital when they don't need to be? What do you know about what it's going to take to decrease readmissions? It's going to take not only the clinical environment, but what happens outside the walls of the clinical arena. It's going to take what happens in the community. It's going to take what happens in something called public health. There is, for the first time, a real financial incentive for everybody to work together, certainly for the clinicians. I'll come back to the financial incentive for the public health people in just a second. So what we now see is the reinvigoration of an old concept called integrated medicine and public health. When I was a senior vice president for professional standards of the AMA, we actually launched with the APHA, the AMA and the APHA, we actually launched an integrated medicine and public health initiative. And it died a slow death for lack of interest for lack of incentives to make it keep going, it, and, and also because leadership changes and so forth and so on. Well, now it's amazing to me that 15 late, years later, we're back. The IOM just had a great report, Primary Care and Public Health, Exploring Integration to Improve Population Health, whether you call it population of enrolled clinical people or community-based population. You should go read the report. Do I love it? No. Is it suboptimal? Yes. Is it timid? Yes. Did it go far enough? No. I love to answer my own questions. <laughs> I can't get any of them wrong. But it's a good start. It's so good 
that when I was at my old place, we, I put money into it to fund it because I really wanted to see it happen. And so, they, they, so read it and you'll start to see. But what's also happening is that ASTO, so I went to the people that run ASTO and they're very good, the Association of State and Territorial Health Office, and Paul Jarris, who is just terrific. You ought to get Paul in here and, and, and talk to you all. Paul is very, very sharp dude. And I challenged Paul and I said, Paul, look here, man. What is public health actually accountable for in this new world order? The docs are accountable for everything. Those poor guys and gals are absolutely measured down to the length of their incisors, right? They, they are, and they hate it. They hate it, but they are. What do you measure public health on? And what value does it bring? Can public health start to put together something that says we will be connecting in some way in accountable and valuable ways into what the delivery system is trying to deal with so that we all can have drive up quality and decrease costs. And so they take that on. And now we have an ASTO Integrated Medicine and Public Health Initiative. Go to their website. I'm a co-convener of it. I'm, I love it and you'll enjoy it. But please go to the ASTO website and do it. Just the other day, CDC, Tom Frieden and his crew came to the IOM and they brought a whole bunch of people together to do integrated medicine and public health. So this genie is out the bottle. People are rolling and they're moving on this pretty rapidly. And so I think this is good that we're starting to get this. This is just a busy slide to just, this is from the ASTO site, and this is like the strategic roadmap. So I want you to go and look into that and deal with it. It basically is just saying that the first thing you gotta do is identify what works then realign funding to, to make sure that things can continue, so be able to scale it, effective measures. Now this is where, I'm gonna tell you, this is gonna be politically unpalatable because nobody likes to be evaluated, nobody. But it is time for public health to be evaluated with real measures and then infrastructure. So go look and see what you think as you go through it. Here's my kind of thing. So you got, now you got the, the governor of Tennessee is like scared to death because his Medicaid budget is going, is it man or woman? Okay, I don't wanna be sexist. So the governor is scared to death because his Medicaid budget is going through the roof. So here you get a clinical group of docs who are saying, we manage a lot of Medicaid kids, right? And they got asthma. So we're gonna commit. We're gonna commit that we're gonna bust our cookies to make sure that every kid uses his or her inhaler just right. They use the right inhaler at the right time. We're gonna, man we're gonna do all the medical stuff we can do. We're gonna help get these kids, prevent these asthmatic attacks. We're gonna do everything we can clinically. So they're gonna really work hard. And we're gonna work really hard with the hospital to make sure that these kids, when they go to the emergency room, that they don't have to get admitted. We're gonna do everything in our power so they don't, they can, if they have to come to the ER, that we'll make sure they get back out again and have a real tight reference and referral back to the primary care. But here's what we really need. We need the public health people to be able to go to the governor and say, excuse me, governor, you know, we're broke. You cut us back this year by a gazillion. I need the permission to hire a couple of new workers who are going to either themselves or who will arrange and contract for somebody to go out into these people's homes and clean out the air conditioning duct, the heating vents, which have been precipitated. Now, I've got to be careful because the former chairman of the pediatrics department, the hospital is here, and he'll say, Tuxin, that's just too simplistic. But allow me to make the point. No, the ducts are filthy. The ducts are filthy. So I'm all right there. Phew, Jesus, God, I was like scared to death. He was going to get on me. <laughs> Somebody's gonna help clean this out to prevent that. And that we will make a deal, Governor, that we will evaluate together the public health and the clinical system working together. We will evaluate and prove to you and your budget officer that we decrease preventable admissions and hospitalizations for Medicaid kids with asthma by much, much more than it costs to hire the workers to go out and do this. We will be accountable for the measurement and we will prove our value. It's a simplistic example, but it's the way I think the only way it is going to be able to make sense going forward. 
Let me just quickly talk about some of the tools that would be necessary for this integration between medicine and public health. We have some great assets in our toolbox that we never had before. And the first one, of course, is this is the era of big data. Now, I do hope there are data geeks all over ETSU. If there are not data geeks, would you please bring them in? If you are a student and you know of the data geek department at ETSU, would you please ask them to become unofficial consultants to your education? You see, you notice I didn't ask the dean to do it? They got a lot to do. You, you just, you don't need permission. <laughs> this is not a military school. <laughs> You can just go anywhere you want. That's the whole thing about being a student. Nobody can say no to you. Just wander over, okay? Just wander over to the, some of you are here because if you get, apparently if you endure, if you have to endure this terrible lecture by me, you get extra credit. So they should, they should have something where you get extra credit for wandering over to the data geeks. And by the way, you, they, they, only, they, don't, they only come out at night. <laughs> It's true, they don't, they don't, they, they don't. They're nocturnal. <laughs> this is the age of big data in everywhere other than health. We're just catching up. We're way behind all the other industries. There's data all the time, growing at 50% per year, more than doubling every two years. It's not just streams of data, it's entirely new ones. There are now countless digital sensors worldwide in industrial equipment, automobiles, electrical meters, and shipping crates. They can measure and communicate, these are important words, they can measure and communicate location, movement, vibration, temperature, humidity, and even chemical changes in the air. Now you're going, Tuxin, what the hell does that have to do with us? Hold the point. So here is the new smart band-aid. And this smart band-aid has a sensor in it. And it can measure humidity and temperature and moisture. And it screams out, I'm infected! <laughs> Which is a whole other thing than the balloon that they gave me when I got my immunization shot the other day to go to Mozambique. Right? So I had a little balloon on my thing. This reads in, in all of that. It also reads um, the, the, the heart rate, your respiratory rate, your cardiac status, and sends it to the cardiologist's smartphone. So maybe the, the patient doesn't have to be in the intensive care unit the whole damn time, but can be someplace other than that. This era of big data is giving us a chance to identify prevention risk and engage at multiple points in the continuum. At one level, America's health rankings, community-based population stuff. Number two, workplace data. And number three, data that focuses on the individual. For America's health rankings, again, you guys, number 39, you know, you're doing all this progress, you're moving forward, we love it, it's very important. But taking that data and making sense out of it is the key. So you gotta do community engagement. Please make sure you know something about how communities think. How do you present epidemiology? Now this America's Health Ranking, I get, because I'm the leader of this thing, I've been doing it for, I did it for, um, for, for, for 20 years almost, right? No, I did it for 13 years. And I'm gonna keep doing it, even though I'm out of the company, I'm gonna continue to do it. I get to have a conversation with America about epidemiology. I go all over America, and when we release it, we, it's the biggest media story for, for health you know, of the week that it's ever out there. I get to have a conversation on epidemiology with America. And you know what? You can actually have a conversation on epidemiology. As long as you tell people this is what is important to you and then you can follow it up with and this is what you can do about it. Very specific. So going into communities and understanding what they're like. That woman in the picture is a woman named Lillian Mobley. And she is a community activist in Watts. And I was telling the students at, at, at dinner tonight, she kicked my hind parts for three years. <laughs> kicked me up one side and down the other. Who is this dude from back east going to tell us about the health of our community? You're not from here. What is your agenda? Why should we trust you? What are your, why would we trust you? Why would we listen to you? 
and it takes time. So those of you who think that you can just walk into a community and we're going to organize it and we're going to help tell them what to do. I used to, when I was health commissioner in D.C., we, we, we're going to have a health fair. We're going to go to the public housing because that's where all the bad epidemiology numbers were. They were the worst in public housing. So we're going to have a health fair. And we got to put our white coats on with our stethoscope dripping out of our pockets. And we hired a clown. And we got a boom box. And we got lots of balloons. And we went out to the community to have a health fair. And nobody showed up. And we knew immediately what the problem was. We didn't have enough four-color brochures. So we made a lot of brochures. And we tacked them up on all the trees, put them everywhere, came back, we fired the clown, got a better one, <laughs> got a bigger boom box and more balloons, went back out again, five people showed up. We, you know what we did then? We got an attitude. What's wrong with those people? They don't deserve the resources of the society. They're bad people. They're terrible. They won't do what's right. Then, after we finished going through that little exercise, right, you know, we had our little personal pity party. When we finished that, we then started thinking about people like Mrs. Mobley, who, are, she doesn't have a degree, but she is the health officer for her community. You don't mess with Lillian Mobley. Everybody knows Ms. Lillian Mobley. So what you do is you hire Ms. Lillian Mobley <laughs> to be your health deputy. Ms. Mobley, we need to have health fair. We need to have something where we go out and work together. And you know what? She didn't pick what was on my list of epidemiological priorities. Oh, no. She had her own deal. They had their own disease they wanted to focus on. So what? It's all the same thing. It's just slow modification. Once you build a highway, you can drive any car you want over the highway. All you do is build a highway. You can, yeah, we'll do yours. Oh, by the way, here's this other thing. <laughs> so we did that. We hired, and she organized the people in public housing. And they were the ones. Then you have a health fair. And it doesn't happen overnight. You don't meet your performance metrics. You know, well, it's got to be like every, every quarter. You know, where else? You know. No, it happens on their timetable. And, and, and guess what? Everybody that works in communities, they're not always lovely people. They're not saints. Might as well just tell you right now. They're not all saints. There's some nasty, evil, angry people who will call you names and waste your time. You can decide, okay, I gave it my best, y'all just die. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> it was nice knowing you. It was cool, because I don't like to be inconvenienced. My daughter is an English major, and she's a competitive literature. And she was, made me, I was trying to read the book she read for a while. <laughs> <laughs> they got to, you know, until I didn't realize that the candle burning in the window on page 48 was the meaning of life, I gave up. <laughs> but she, was, she made me reread the play by Camus. Now, do you remember the play? Y'all, if you didn't, I don't think you remember the play. Remember the book, the play. You should read that again. But it's, it's, it's the bubonic plague, right? And, and it's like rats are running like every gosh damn where in this town. And, and, and people have got these gigantic bubbles, these abscesses, and they're draining pus and, and, and rats and pus and stink and filth. Can you imagine the doc? You know, this is just a little bit inconvenient. <laughs> I don't really think I want to do this. When y'all get these rats under control, call me. I'll be back. I mean, you don't get to, Once you all took this acceptance to ETSU, you screwed. <laughs> You're screwed. You can't walk away. You, I'm sorry if, if the people don't want to act right. They, they call me names. Uh, they said I was from North Carolina when I am working in Tennessee. You know, I don't have the right accent, you know. Whatever, you, you're screwed. You can't walk away. You got to stay forward. So you get your butt kicked for three years by Mrs. Mobley until you got it kicked so bad, she got so tired of kicking it that she finally said, baby, that's the way she talks, baby, it'll never happen again, whatever you need. You showed us who you were. You showed us you had integrity. You showed us that we could what? Trust you, and now we're going to roll and we rolled together hard. And she became the person that taught me more about community organizing, but I never had a course in it. They never teach that stuff in school to you. So learn community organizing is my point. We also went out now and tried to convince the business community. Can we convince the business community that they need to be a part of community strategic planning? Because it's their money that's at stake. 
It's their employees who have to live in the context of family and community, right? You are an employee, you live in the context of family and community. If the community sucks, have you ever gone down the, I got a new thing I've been doing lately, where you, know, you go down to the, and you, you see the billboard that says, home of the new plant, right? So I now look carefully, you see, you drive down the road and you see billboard, greatest heart hospital in Tennessee. Dun, da, 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 da. Then you imagine, okay, you go across to the next county and you see a big old sign that says, didn't need no damn heart hospital because we're the healthiest heart county in Tennessee. Now where do you think they're gonna build a plant? So that's the way I'm trying to talk to the employers. And so, we, so you go to the employers and you say, here is your epidemiological statistics for what's killing people in your town. Can you guys decide through your business coalition to be involved? Because the poor public health people are sitting there with no money. The governor cut their budget like crazy. The community-based resources are drying up. They need, you've got a thing in, in employers, they have called it social responsibility. It's a wonderful concept. What does it mean usually? They give like $5 for the golf tournament for the Little Sisters of the St. Elsewhere. <laughs> now you can't be against the Little Sisters of the St. Elsewhere, they're wonderful people. But come on, is that what's really killing the people where, is that gonna, you gotta say to them, look, you have a self-interest in bringing your resources to bear, and you bring the church and the civic coast and fraternity and sorority, the chamber of commerce, and you help being a catalyst because you got people that what? know how to get stuff done. So you need to get them involved. Well, I've been preaching it and preaching it, finally we just gave them money. We hire, here's a person to hire to be your community health planner. So we're doing this now in six cities, and what we are learning is it works if you actually give them somebody to be there. So some of you are looking for jobs. What I want you to be able to do is, and if, let's say you were in a community and you can't, there's no job. Dust off your resume. Go over to the business coalition and say, hey, hire me for, no, I'm, 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 I'm cheap. Hire me, because I'm broke anyway. Hire me, and I will organize the community fight that will help make sure that your employees live in an environment where they don't get sick unnecessarily. And you create your own space. So just keep that in mind when you're broke. Do you all study the Guide to Community Preventive Services? Do you know what they don't know? Extra credit. You should get extra credit. Go, just go find out what was not funded that was on their list of priorities. You think that'd be an interesting exercise? Wouldn't you be curious to know what we don't have evidence for and there's no resources to find the answer? Wouldn't that be an interesting intellectual exercise? I told you that healthcare, medical care is inconsistent with the best science half the time. What do you think our number is for public health? What is the best science for what works? If you are, if you, I've had to do this many times in my life. Go to the Congress, or even worse, go to the state legislature, even worse, go to the city council and say, excuse me, we need some money to do program X, Y, Z. And they're, they're going, Dude, the, we failed on the half a penny tax for schools. Couldn't get it through. Everywhere I've ever been, the half penny tax for schools failed. We won't give you a dime for education. And you're talking about taking some of that little teeny dollars we have and doing, does it work? How do you know it works? Where's the science? Where's the evidence? So be attentive to the Guide for Community Preventive Services. By the way, Extra credit. Call your senator and your congresspeople and ask them, did you support the budget for the Community Guide for Preventive Services for the CDC this year? Find out whether their position is on it. You know what? They'll ever, you know what they all tell you? Nobody's ever said this to me in my life. I don't even know what it is. But you know what? And I'm on the advisory committee for the head of NIH. Everybody's been here telling me about the NIH. Which is more important? Which is ultimately more important? To know what works and the cost effectiveness of what works for community prevention or NIH? 
given the scenario I laid out. Think about it. It's a very interesting deal. But you don't have anybody marching down for the guide for music, and you got everybody marching down for NIH. And I love NIH. I love NIH. It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's a strange country. <laughs> now, here's what ASTO is doing. ASTO is doing something very interesting. We are now taking all the evidence from the guy from, the, from American Health Ranking and looking at learning. Which states moved up? So you're 39, the move, we're going to study. Why did people move and what can we learn? So that's going to be a great public health thing. Well, I'm going to close out here quickly. I, was going to, I could have talked to you about the data that's available for, for, um, for um, employers. I'll just tell you there's going to be a huge amount of data for employers. I won't have time to do it. But on the individual. How do we help them adopt personally appropriate lifestyle, lifestyles and behaviors? How do you make them make, make personal choices? And how do you help them have better quality outcomes of care? So the data. These are the data assets that are coming now. Medical claims, lab and pharmacy claims, health risk assessments and health screenings, electronic medical records and health information exchange, biometric, mobile health apps, coaching, and care management. All those data sets are now being brought together to talk to each other. This is why I want you all to meet the geeks. This is not easy. None of these data sets were intended to flow together, and there are actually some kind of weird people who speak only regression analysis, who somehow or another have been able to merge those together. Then you can analyze and liquefy that data, liquefy it, liquefy it, and then you can run algorithmic rules on it so that you will then make sense out of it, and then to give patients information and their doctors. So when they're in the grocery store aisles, you can give that person information on their Blackberry or their iPhone thing, and it says, okay, here's what you need to know. Very specific, and you can give it to the doc. And then you can also do something that is very new. Multivariable testing techniques to identify preferred individual engagement strategies. Guess what? People are different. People are very different. So how do we know, how come people don't do what they're supposed to do? Not because they're stupid. Many people don't do it because they're paralyzed by fear and anxiety. They're just terrified. Did you do your, mammal, your, breast, your, your self breast examination? No, because mama did it and she felt a lump and she died. I'll be damned if I'm going to do it. That's a rational human response. That's how people think. If you don't understand that, you won't get anywhere with any, telling anybody to, to, to self examine their breast. People think they're scared to death. Too many decide their health is not as important as others. My life is too complex. I have to take care of my kids and my grandkids. It's too late for me. It's all fate anyway. And then, did you know that the obesity is actually a, a, a virus that just jumps on you all of a sudden? It's like one day you wake up and you're obese. Who knew? It's so subtle. It's so insidious. It's like, Jesus God, I'm obese. What am I going to do? This is one where you can get in a lot of trouble. I could have put a, 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 a white person there. I could have put you know, old lady, the blue haired ladies. I could have done them. I did this one, so you get in trouble. So you gotta be careful on this. So I'm sitting in the barbershop. And the men, I'm, I, my barbershop, the men are on this side. I'm African American, by the way. And so. <laughs> And the women are on this side, and the men on this side. And I was watching all this stuff go on across the way. And I was wondering, what the hell are they doing? What is all this? So one day I walked across the Great Divide. A hush fell across the entire place. What the hell is he doing? Where is he going? And I said, excuse me, respectfully, what's happening? How much does it cost? Jesus, goodness, it costs that much? And it's competition. Right? I said, are you going to exercise when this is over? She said, I'm holy roller. I'm not even jumping up in church Sunday. I'm not sweating this thing out. Are you crazy? And I started to realize that this is like a real issue, that people spend that much money on their hair. They are not going to screw it up. And so I got into the thing where I said, well, what are we going to do about this? This is what I mean by talking to people. I'm always using this example because I want you to be thinking about how people you know, need to be dealt with. So you talk to people, and you figure out, and you listen. And you say, well, is this real? Then all of a sudden I find out that there is a group called the Bonner Brothers Hair Folk. 60,000 cosmetologists come to a convention every year in Atlanta. 60,000 people. So I went. And we sponsored a healthy hair style competition. 
And now we're the second biggest event in the 60,000 thing. The only reason why we're not the biggest is because you can't spend more money on our thing than the extravaganza where they walk around with like an entire leaning tower of pizza on their head. <laughs> and that was the winner, right? And the winner was a white cat, <laughs> which is kind of cool. That's Regina Benjamin on the, on the right, Surgeon General of the United States, right? And, and all these various people. My point was that we, all these folks, and we actually are starting now to deputize 60,000 cosmetologists to be ambassadors of health. You gotta listen to people. I'll close out on, here's the thing. Here's the, so I told you the data assets were a tool. You guys are so lucky coming into public health now because now we gotta stitch together this integrated medicine and public health. We gotta be able to help people do the right thing because their value-based benefit designs are there. So you can't just say, okay, here's your value-based benefit design, your financial incentive for doing right. You gotta help them to do right. You got the delivery system needs to be connected. You gotta stitch people together. The data is essential. Secondly is you're living in this world with wireless and broadband technology revolution that gives you the ubiquitous internet email capabilities so that people like my mother can send dirty jokes to thousands and thousands of people every day. <laughs> I was surprised to see how many seniors are online. There are zillions. What they don't tell you is what they're doing. It's all dirty. Enabling mobile smartphones and personal digital devices. I called my knucklehead son that was in that picture and no answer. I called him again, no answer. I called him, no answer. I checked the bill, I paid it, I called him, no answer. All of a sudden, words come across my phone. I'd never seen words on my phone before. I send word back, words come back at me. I send words, words come back. I pick up the phone and call him, no answer. <laughs> the only thing Lance wants is yes, no, send money. Straightforward. We're different people. The apps, ubiquitous. It enables your social network. And now, because you are smart and you went over and you studied this with those people, you now know that crowd behavior, your social network, probably has as much to do with your behavior for health as the geographical environment in which you live. The social network you have is as important as the geography in which you live. And then it used to be that that was the, the, a, a fancy new thing that you had on your, that you could use, and it was obsolete within a week because the, the camera on your smartphone is so good. So synchronous video communication, allowing you to talk to the doctor remotely in real time with no problem. Not like your Wolf Blitzer and the person's in Iraq with the delay. It's like you go and they go, and it's right there, and you can <laughs> talk. Third, I told you about the sensor technology. The largest source of data in the world is sensor-based technologies. Your digital smart band-aids, which I talked to you about before. Remote blood pressure monitoring. So now here is you are sitting at home, shooting all the, now of course the poor doc is going, ah! <laughs> Stop already with the numbers. So we got some work to do on that. Your exertion monitor, my Fitbit is on never leaves me, right, never leaves me. And then I always connect it with, by the way, my sensor or my, with my heart rate, because I work out every other day or every day. And so I got those, and I got my two, like last night at one o'clock, I'm merging my Fitbit data with my polar data, and I'm looking at my charts to see how bad I do suck, and it was you know, terrible. <laughs> Next you got the new gaming technologies. Excuse me, young man, you will take a dose of exercise. You will exercise regularly. Now take your castor oil. Or I kick my Xbox Connect. And I just do something, and it's called what, play? But guess what, I did? we just did a study. Your heart rate goes up just as much as if you were doing something called exercise. We just don't call it that. You don't have to call it that. Just play. And look who's doing it. It's the whole family, who has very little time together today. So let them do it together as a family, instead of going out to the gym. And it works. The point, and then finally, you have this new thing called the genome. Put all of that together. This is the era in which you're coming of age in public health. You're putting all of that together. So now we assess the individual engagement. Are you assured or overwhelmed? Or someplace in between. Meet Sam. He is the integration of medicine and public health. He's overwhelmed. 35-year-old cook, struggled with obesity since childhood, currently taking antihypertensive, antidepressants, allergies for back pain. I know I'm overweight, but I've always been this way. I'm not a joiner. Group programs are not for me. I need something personal. Health system navigation. I know I should follow my doctor's advice, but I don't know what the hell she's talking about. 
affordability issue. I put off my stress test because I don't know how much it's going to cost me and I don't think I can afford it. So he's all those things. So now he won't exercise with everybody else, so we give him an op a mobile app. And when his app allows him to put in what his goals are. I'm ready to lose weight, he says. How much are you ready to lose? Here are your goals. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to make it transparent to his boys. So now they're sharing it online. Hey, Sam, how'd you do? And they're going to say how they did, like my boys do for me with my biking. I, ran, I rode 50 miles the other day. Gia Reed, you suck. We rode 132. I go out and ride another three. <laughs> Best I could do. Then he tracks it and connects it to the Fitbit, so it's online. Then he's saying, I'm not making the progress I want. So he wants to call a coach, so he calls a coach. And in this world now, he calls the coach, and the coach is happy to talk to him about what is going on. But in the best of all worlds, because we have these integrated data streams, the coach is sitting there with all of his medical records. And then he can say, I'm happy to talk to you about your, your workout and your racing and running and your eating, but guess what, you didn't get your glucose checked. And now we've got to close that gap. Integration across systems. There has never been a time for that. But here's what I also want you to think about. I want you to make another field trip. I'm going to ruin the curriculum. And I'm almost at the end because I know I'm, they started five minutes late, so I'm only four and a half minutes over. <laughs> All of this stuff is circling around. The question is, what's it mean for human cognition? How do we get it to change behavior? So I want you to go visit you, your psychologist. Psychiatric. Psychiatric, so the crazy one. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We need you to go visit the psychology department and the consumer advertising department of the business school. You need to take a field trip. All of you just go over there and then invade them and then take up all the chairs for the other students so they can't sit down and then ask them a question. I've been reading these people I've been trying to read these books by people who are smart about how consumers think. How do you get in their heads? And so you see all these people. And I wrote a book called The Doctor in the Mirror, which is all about because people kept telling me, it's too cold to exercise. It's too hot to exercise. I don't have the right gym clothes. All I was hearing was barriers, barriers to why you can't. I'm sick and tired of the barriers. So I wanted to explore those barriers with people. So think about some of these books. Switch. Uh, nudge, drive, think fast, think slow. You should be reading these things instead of watching Oprah or something, you know? How do you affect people? Awareness. Health beliefs. How likely does the person believe that the health event will lead to something in the future? How confident are you that you have the ability to make the appropriate decision? How likely is it that your behaviors will affect the outcomes? Then skill building. Learning how to do new things. Participation. Gaining self-confidence, small steps at a time. Maintenance, reinforcement, reinforcement of social networks, and financial. The point being is learning how to do all those things. And then my last slide is, once you've kind of gotten a handle on all that stuff, then we're going to have to work together around using some of these new tools in the community environment. As I mentioned, the Meals on Wheels, the home health care aids. Now we have the biometry devices, so we can actually have a person stand on a scale and feed that information back to the care manager. You can actually do, as I mentioned, the glucose monitoring. You can do all these sort of things now. And the question will be, who does it, who arranges it, and how does the data, who organizes the data, and how does it flow? And then how do you take the data and turn it into really focused community education and engagement at the macro level while we work on it at the micro level? This is a very exciting time to come of age in public health. You, we need to achieve a unifying shared vision with transparent accountability for optimizing health. And we can't have enemies. Everybody has got to be in this together now. And so I really appreciate what you all are trying to do. I think this is, without sugarcoating it, the future looks bleak. Those statistics that I gave you earlier are going to, I believe, continue for a while to continue to get worse. There's no question that the economics of medical care are going to continue to have real bad upward pressure. Because every new thing costs more than the old thing. We don't know how to use the new thing well. right? So it's all challenging. On the other hand, we've got more tools, 
new financial models, new incentives, uh, and new opportunities to work hard to overcome it. So I would rather you face the future soberly. You can't get out of it because you, you accepted admission. So you're in it. So now you've got to see it all the way through. So anyway, I wish you luck. I, by the way, just to make sure you know where I'm at, I am extraordinarily optimistic. I am extraordinarily energized by the challenges. I do not feel that you're going to be, if I, you would have loved me if I had said, oh, here's a single magic bullet. Just do this. But no, it's working in all those sectors all at once at the same time. Okay? It isn't easy. And it's not, this business and this work is not for people that were looking for easy way outs. This is hard work. It's also, by the way, the work that defines the quality and character of the American democratic society. You cannot have chosen anything more noble to be involved in. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I'll tell you, but, but those of you that need to like scram, because the babysitter is like going to be like $5, I ain't paying it, so you need to go. <laughs> I'm not upset if anyone has to leave. And people can disagree vehemently with me. I'd rather hear it here than in the bathroom, and for the women, you know, we're listening to the wall. <laughs> anything, by the way, it can be anything. Um, you were talking about um, how there are more monitors that can be just like send the data to the physicians. Since the population is aging in America, how do you get the older people who are technologically incompetent and kind of, well, not necessarily technologically incompetent, but I, I know that my grandparents, they have a cell phone, but it took them years and years and years to get a cell phone and they still, like whenever you're talking about those words coming across the screen, they have no idea what you're doing. So how do you get so them you got, on board? So you got her back to three of us. <laughs> I brought my boys with me. <laughs> I brought my own posse with me. And she's telling me, I'm pretty good at this stuff, I'll take. No, listen, it's a serious question. It's a good question. Um, the, the answer is that, uh, uh, first of all, um, no one size fits all. And, 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 but, but what will clearly happen is that the, baby, the boomers that are aging every day, uh, they are going to be on it. So there are some folks who are downstream a little bit. I gave my mother, um, and it was a very strange day. I gave her for Christmas one of those monitors where you wear that, that senses with great accuracy whether you've fallen over or not. And she wasn't really pleased. <laughs> you know, it wasn't the best received gift. You know, I'm falling over and I can't get up. Is that what you're trying to say? Are you trying to say I'm incompetent and da 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 da? And she really went into a deal, man. But then she kind of got into it a little bit and she recognized because none of us live in the same city as my mom's. And so she kind of got it. And, and then she, she didn't want to, like, because she's such a lovely lady, she didn't want to get it wet when she took a shower, so she put it on the door jam of the bathroom. Well, she closed the door to take her shower, and she closed it fairly rapidly, which, of course, elicited emergency phone calls <laughs> <laughs> from, the, from the company going, are you all right? Are you all right? You know. And so she's now, my mother is like, actually sent a letter to the president of the company uh, saying how great their product is. So, um, but, but, but the point is, is that I would say um, there are a lot of senior centers that are trying to train. My mother actually, by coincidence, teaches computer literacy to her peeps, you know, uh, at the community center. Um, you might volunteer yourself one day as a way of something to do for extra credit or just kind of getting at it. I mean, so since you are concerned about it, go on out and do it. Um, but even better, um, can you imagine that if we could get grandkids and uh, to be trained to, to work with their grandparents. And it, you know, can you imagine somebody actually giving a grant to grandchildren to teach their parents how to, grandparents how to do stuff? I mean, think creatively, think out of the box. But I would not be overly sad because we're talking really about trends that will fully manifest themselves over the next 10 years. And by that point, the baby boomers will be the old folks and they will be, they'll be they, they're on it already. But it's a great question. Yeah, I think that's a cool idea, by the way. I like this idea. Can we te get the, what if you, you know how you have the Boy Scouts? What, wait a minute. Why can't we have a Boy Scout merit badge or a Girl Scout merit badge for teaching? Doggone it. Take this. You got it. I give it to you. Go run with this. <laughs> <laughs> the 
that's a damn good idea. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, my name is uh, Hari Mamudu. And uh, you've shown some uh, interesting, ex exciting technology here. But uh, the bottom line is that these very technologies are those things that are running up our healthcare costs. So how do we reconcile these very things, the existence of these things coming up and up, and the cost that you are saying we should control? And so his question is a very, very, provocative and appropriate one. He's saying that the technologies are the things that are driving up the costs. So the technologies I showed, by the way, are not actually in the medical care reimbursement system, most of those things. They're, in, they're, they're, out of, they're the consumer out of pocket. So one of the things I guess I would, just to, I want to come back to the thesis of your point, but I want to mess with your point a little bit, is you've allowing me to make a, a very important nuanced point here. I'm trying by those slides to get healthcare out of the healthcare ghetto. And I'm trying to put it in just living. I learned it best when I was, I was in New Orleans for uh, a conference and I had a day where I did nothing but conference calls. I'm stuck in my hotel room and it's boring as hell. And I did call after call after call. And finally I decided I need to go out and take a walk. So I pulled out my cell phone and it, I have an app called Around Me, which tells me whatever is going on around me. And it said coffee shop, you know, so many yards away or whatever. So I got up and, I, and, then, it, and then instantly a map appeared. Boom, map, wow. And the map walks me to the Starbucks, right? Or Caribou, depending on who's listening. And I walk to the thing. And now I'm getting out and I'm actually getting steps in. Then I'm in this store and I push a button to figure out what's the least worse, nutritionally, of what's in there, right? It's great grammar, but anyway. <laughs> and I'm looking and making my choice. While I'm looking up the least worse, there's a great song on with a terrific rhythm. So I push this other thing, Shazam, and I hold it up, and it tells me the name of the song. Then it asks me instantly, do I want to buy it? And I buy it all with the snap of a finger. I buy my stuff, the app walks me back to the hotel, I finish my last call, I go down to the gym, I put on my new tune with the great rhythm, and my heart rate goes up 20% higher than it would have, because I'm really rocking with the, with the tune. You know, who knew that Henry Mancini could be great? <laughs> so, which part of that story is health, and which part is living? That's what blew my mind. I was just living. I didn't decide to do health. I just decided to go outside. Everything that happened translated into health. And it was all my purchases out of my pocket. It wasn't, so it, nobody will see it in terms of healthcare costs. My point is we gotta get health out of the health ghetto and make it just living. We, I'm a health professional. No, man, don't be a health professional. Well, yes, be a health professional, because you have to have the values and the ethics. But I'm saying is it just be with the architects, too, and be with the, you know, be with the Boy Scouts, and be with any, everybody. Don't get all tightened up around. That's why I don't want the people up front to be only, I like what you're doing, but invite some other people to the party. Because as long as y'all are your own ghetto, you, you're going to just be as dumb as y'all are now. Because <laughs> we're dumb. We gotta bring the geeks in, bring the damn data people in who don't know anything. And Deb, I gave a, the keynote, one of the keynotes to the Consumer Electronics Show this year, Las Vegas. The Consumer Electronics, I mean, it's like all the weirdest people you ever wanna see in your whole life. And it's a gigantic ballroom. And I took a magic wand out and I went, I deputize each and every one of you to be health officers. And they were like, wow, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> because they know stuff that we don't know. Now, to finish up so you can go home. Yes, on the medical technologies, the costs are increasing. And the unit costs, by the way, all the cost drivers, it's not just, I, I spent all that time on utilization. The biggest driver in cost escalation is unit costs. The price of things is more than the utilization. Here's what you got to worry about. And I worry about this all the time. If you are investment capital that is prepared to invest in innovation, why would you invest in health when you can make a lot more money in cosmetics, 
and here and there. Because everybody is worried about unit cost escalation. Everybody is worried about regulating and controlling and so on. So you have to be very, people you know, have to be very careful about how much value we are demanding. You got the FDA to go through, and then once you get past the FDA, now, it used to be you had to go through the FDA. That was the bar. Now it's value, which is above the FDA. So if you're venture capital, why the hell would I go through all of that? So we're going to have to be very concerned about having money for innovation. But at the end of the day, we need innovation that's going to bring quality up and lower costs. So I appreciate your point. Uh, and the only things that are going to make it in America are going to be things that drive quality up and lower costs, because nobody's going to pay for it at the end of the day. And the providers who use it are going to get screwed. Because if you're an inpatient specialist, Loving that technology, ooh, I'm the cardiac imaging specialist. And I got a $40,000 billion new machine, and it's in my building, and it's going to cost a lot. Remember I told you about the pricing center medical home? You get mo your money is based on driving quality and taking costs out, not having people in the hospital. If you're the primary care doctor in this new world, you're going, I have been waiting all of my life to get back at you damn specialists. You always got the money for doing stuff, and I, talking to someone, diagnosing, I got nothing. Well, guess what? <laughs> I ain't sending anybody to you. I'm only going to send my patients to the most cost-effective, quality people, and they ain't in the hospital, because that's where it costs five times more than outside here. So I'm sending my patients to my boys who are going to be cost, and, and the money that we save I'll share with them. So you're going to see a lot of those things change. OK, I'm sorry. Last one, then we'll let you go home, because you are overly polite and you won't leave. <laughs> and you're missing some great thing that you could be reading. One. one more. Come on, come on, come on. Don't be afraid. It's OK. I'm not going to. I'll, I'll be short. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Take care. Right. <laughs> um, Dr. Tuxton, before you take off, we do have some we do have some parting gifts for you in oh. the best tradition. Oh, I didn't know. Well, first, we, we, we want to give you your very own 39 ah. pen. Um, I can send you some of the other ones, too, as well. And then also, uh, more seriously, um, recognition as an honorary professor in the College of Public oh, Health at ETSU. I got a book thing with, that you can put stuff in with y'all. Yeah. Right. And we can, we can mail that back for you. But, but thank you so much. Very, great honor. Thank you all. You're very nice. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Here, I've been, take the, the people's prayers have come true. Um, the last leading voices uh, of the year will be in two weeks. Dr. John Dreisner, the Commissioner of Health, is going to be talking about lessons learned from the most recent meningitis outbreak, the largest health care outbreak. Uh, according to the CDC, which with the epicenter right here in Tennessee. So his perspectives, I think, will be really interesting. Y'all say Tennessee saved the nation. And there's a woman physician. What's her name? I'm sure I said, yeah. She kicked butt. And when you hear him talk, you make sure y'all she did study what she did. She saved our bacon on that one. She did some heroic, real tight, professional public health. And if it wasn't, because I'll tell you, I, mean, I saw this, I, it, was a, it was not pretty. Because I saw it on national issue. It was a crappy response, crappy all, and disparate all around the country. And if it wasn't for what Tennessee did, we would not have seen what we needed to know, and it would have been a model for how other states should have behaved. So y'all just know it was some good work done.